Okay, so Luke chapter 1, verse 26. In the, in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth. We're going to skim this part of the structure of the service today is that uh, I get less time to preach than normal. Um, I think we kind of figure that when visitors come in, they might not want to have the, the, the full dose of Anthony on day one. But... Uh, uh, we'll, so we'll have to skim some of these details. But it's interesting that w- w- many, of us, many of us are familiar with the fact that, that Jesus was raised in a place called Nazareth. We know that he was born in Bethlehem. Um, but then subsequently he was taken to Nazareth where he was raised. Later on, because the scribes and the Pharisees were aware that Jesus was to be born or the Messiah was to be born in Bethlehem, they, they denied the messiahship of Jesus on the basis, well, we know where he's from. He's from Nazareth. Nothing good has ever come from Nazareth. And yet, we read in Isaiah that this land in which there had been great darkness, which is this northern region where Nazareth is, that that land of great darkness will see a great light. And it's funny that immediately in John's Gospel, after Jesus, uh, after the Pharisees rather say, does anything good come from Nazareth? Jesus then goes into his, I am the light of the world speech. He's alluding back to Isaiah to say, yeah, it has been a dark place. But now it is a place of great light because I am the light of the world. So there's all of that going on with the reference to Nazareth in the Bible. And Gabriel, the only angel, the only common angel that is named in scripture, is sent from God to this place to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. Betrothed, if you don't know, it's an old word. We don't use it very often. Perhaps we should use it more in Christian circles. It's the, the nearest equivalent to our modern concept of engagement that a couple will get engaged. Oh, and by the way, I shouldn't redo really it in the middle of a sermon, but many of you are familiar with Logan, who was at our church for, for a couple of years, and then he moved back out of state to be with his family. He got engaged yesterday. So congratulations to Logan, for those who know. Sorry, just as a spur of the moment as I'm thinking about engagement. They are betrothed. Now, we in our society have very strange engagement concept. We have strange engagement rituals. And rituals change. I mean, you know, are you even allowed to get engaged without there being photos and, you know, and, and, and what have you? I mean, everything is, 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 is developing and changing now with all these new strange rituals. But we have situations in our culture now where couples um, will, will date for years and years and years and then they'll get engaged and then sometimes they'll be engaged for years and years and years as well. A betrothal is, is different from that. It's what an engagement should be, but really often isn't these days. And a betrothal is a commitment to marry. It's a commitment to marry. And so seriously was it taken that you had to have a divorce, a certificate of divorce, to break a betrothal. In fact, some of the Old Testament passages concerning divorce are misunderstood because they're actually divorces of betrothals rather than divorces of marriages, per se. And so we we have this situation where a commitment is made and it's considered almost as serious as a commitment of marriage. It can't just be left or forgotten about or, or let's not do this. But at the same point, it's not marriage and it allows for the preparation of the time. Now, for couples who are engaged in this time, many of them are, are, um, are spending a lengthy period of time, I don't know, checking to make sure they were happy with the decision. I'm not quite sure what the deal is. But really with a betrothal, it's just the preparation for marriage. And we have a situation today where couples are, uh, who are engaged are constantly together. But in that culture, a betrothal was often determined as much by the parents 
as by the individuals getting married. And that really there was, there was much less interaction between the couples depending on circumstances and what have you. So this is a, it's quite a formal thing. I don't want us to come at this text with 21st century eyes and to think that, you know, Mary and Joseph were living together or Mary and Joseph kind of, you know, had been dating for years or anything like that. In all reality, they may not have known each other that well. As shocking as that might sound to us, which I think gives us quite an important context to the remainder of this passage. Now, Matthew's Gospel deals predominantly with the story of Joseph. Boy, did he have some things to work through with all that was going on. But Mary is the one that's focused on in Luke's gospel. And it is her that is spoken of. And he is betrothed to Mary and she is a virgin. Now there's been much debate and of course all the, all the kind of liberal academia is what gets into the mainstream press. And so many people have said, oh, was, was Jesus really born of a virgin? Did the Old Testament really say that? And there's disputes over the Hebrew word Alma and whether that really means virgin or not. Let's just be absolutely clear on this point. And I've talked through Isaiah, or at least the first part of it, and, and, and dealt with this at length. And you can go back on the website and see that. But about two centuries before Christ was born, the Old Testament was the process, at least, of it being translated from Hebrew into Greek began. Two centuries before the time of Christ. And when they translated the Hebrew word in Isaiah concerning the virgin birth, they translated that word with the Greek word parthenos, which can only mean a virgin. It is a technical term. It does not mean a young woman. It doesn't just mean some fair maiden. It means specifically a virgin. And that's the word used here. So it is absolutely abundantly clear that not only was there a prophecy concerning a virgin birth, but that there was a virgin birth. And that is a consistent teaching of the whole Bible. And of course, a betrothed couple um, still being virgins, it was completely normal and, and how it was, how it would, was at that time and how it should still be ideally today. And that there they were betrothed and they are betrothed to a man whose name is Joseph of the house of David. Now the house of David reference is interesting because of course, Jesus is not going to be descended through Joseph, genetically speaking. And yet he is from the house of David, just as Mary is. Because Jesus is going to come from the house of David. And Mary needs to be from the house of David, but it's nice touch that Joseph is too. Now, it starts to get interesting. The virgin's name is Mary. He comes to her and says, Greetings, O favoured one. The Lord is with you. Now, there's two things that we've really got to get our heads around in this statement. Okay? Number one is Lord. Now, we've had this conversation many times, but we'll have it many times more. And I don't apologize for that. So let's just be clear. When you read your Old Testament, I know we're in the New Testament here, but when you read your Old Testament, you will see the word Lord a lot. When you see the word Lord, with normal small letters, a capital L, but then a little o, little r, little d, then it is a translation of the Hebrew word Adonai. It just means Lord, boss, master, one who is in charge. But often in your Old Testaments, you see the word Lord capitalized. Capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. And that is a translation of the Hebrew word Yahweh. Sometimes in olden times it was called Jehovah. It is the very name of God. It's not just saying the one who is boss. It's saying God, Yahweh, the Jewish God, the God of Israel. He who created the heavens and the earth. And more so than all of that, it is his covenant name. And it, it is his name is his character, is his glory. You see that very clearly in Exodus 33 and 34 when Moses uh, has this interaction with God and God reveals himself to Moses and, and God declares his name. I am Yahweh, I am Yahweh, I am Yahweh. And in the revealing of his name, Moses sees his glory and God declares his attributes and his character. These things are all linked together. 
So when we come then to the New Testament and we see the word Lord, we always have to ask ourselves, what, which Lord are they speaking about here? Because in the Old Testament, they give us the answer. <laughs> it's either there in small letters or capital letters. Ah, oh, there's Adonai, there's Yahweh. But in the New Testament, which Lord are they referring to? So when it says, O favoured one, the Lord is with you, I don't think it's merely saying that the boss is with you, but it's saying that Yahweh is with you. It's an astonishing statement. The history of Israel is predominantly a history of the relationship between God and his people. And how, for the bulk of their history, God was with them. He was with them because he dwelt in the temple. He dwelt before that in the tabernacle. That God's presence came to be with his people, and that while, he, while they had the tabernacle and the temple, God was there with them. They were the people of God. Where is God? He is in the Holy of Holies. He is in the tabernacle. He is in the temple. Our God is with us. But then came their sin and their idolatry. Ezekiel the prophet speaks about the presence of God leaving the temple so that by the time that Nebuchadnezzar came in at the time of Daniel and destroyed the temple, he didn't get burnt up by being in the presence of God when he went into the Holy of Holies because God had already left. There's a 70 years of captivity and then there is a decree for the people to return. And Nehemiah speaks of the rebuilding of the city. And Ezra speaks of the rebuilding of the temple. And then the prophet Haggai comes along. And he speaks of this rededication of the new temple. And old men who were there who remembered the old one, they wept. Because the glory of the temple was not as great as the former. You see, when the tabernacle was complete, whoosh! The presence of God came in, filled the place that the priests couldn't do their duties. When the temple was built under Solomon, whoosh, the presence of God comes in and the priests can't fulfill their duty. It was made clear that God has shown up. But now, in the time of Haggai, in the time of Ezra, when the new temple is built, the second temple, there's no whoosh. There's no cloud. There's no rushing wind. There's no presence of God. And so the temple initially was smaller than Solomon's temple. It wasn't as grand architecturally. And so the physical glory was less, but far, far more importantly, God had not returned to be with his people. Now, the declaration is made Yahweh is with you. For centuries, Yahweh hasn't been with his people in the sense that he was. But now, the angel comes and says, Yahweh's with you, O favoured one. You have God. He is with you. And <laughs> in a very real sense, Mary is going to be a temple. Because God is going to dwell literally within her. And Haggai in that passage prophesies that the glory of that second temple will one day be greater than the former. And of course, eventually Herod did all these architectural extensions and it did become greater than Solomon's temple in a physical sense. But far more importantly, in John chapter 2, Jesus walks into that temple and turns the tables over. And now the temple has the presence of God within it again. And the glory of the second temple was greater than the former. Because Jesus, as we will see next Sunday, was full of grace and truth. So, all of this is going on in this. And the second thing in this statement to pick on is, is that she is called, O favoured one. O oh, favoured one. It's a, it's a fascinating statement. I think the danger as we read this 
is that we might be inclined to think that somehow Mary was this wonderful person and God said, oh my goodness, at last, I've been waiting for somebody half decent to come along and now we've got this magnificent person and I really, really like her because she's really, really good, so I'm going to favour her. And, and we have this understanding of favour being apportioned on the basis of what we do. It is alien to the text. <laughs> And I think that Catholic sensibilities sometimes spread to us in this regard. That isn't to play down Mary. It's not to speak uh, um, uh, badly of Mary in, in any way. She is clearly somebody who is, is a godly woman and is lifted up in Scripture in many different ways. However, why is she favoured? Because God chose to favour her. And what was she favoured with? Well, obviously, in one sense, the answer is very, very clear. She is going to be favoured because she is going to be the mother of the Messiah. She is the woman that we have waited for since Genesis chapter 3, when we were, where it was prophesied that the Messiah would, there would be the seed of the woman that would crush the head of the seed of the serpent. That the issue of sin will be dealt with by this offspring. And they've been waiting for this woman. And she is going to be that woman. When Isaiah talks of the virgin birth in Isaiah 7. He says, the virgin will bear a son. Even then at that point there was this one specific woman who would give birth. And Mary is going to be that one. She is favoured. But what else is she favoured with? She's favoured with being pregnant out of wedlock in a society that had absolutely zero tolerance for that. Even into his adulthood, suggestions of Jesus' origins were questioned because of that situation. She had to go through all of that. She then, for much of Jesus' ministry in his life, she didn't believe that he was the Messiah. She who believed early on seemed to doubt later on. We see that in the Gospel accounts. And ultimately, she watches her son, who she loved, her son who had never sinned, her son who was love, whipped, mocked, spat upon, scourged with the skin ripped from his flesh and then crucified. Some favour, huh? Reminds me of that line from Fiddler on the Roof where Tevia says, I know we're your chosen people, but can't you choose somebody else for a change? You see, when the hand of God is upon you, it is... It is a terrible thing. And I don't mean that in a purely negative sense, but terrible in the sense of an awesome thing, a majestic thing, a thing with, with great responsibility, a thing of great burden, a thing of great joy, a thing of great sadness, a thing which is just, is just there. Why? Because God chose her. God chose her. He said, you're the one, that's what you're going to do. Every single one of us who are Christians have been chosen. Ephesians 1, very, very clear, chapter 1, verse 4. He chose you before the foundation of the world. Chapter 2 of Ephesians goes on and says that you were not saved by works so that no man should boast, but you were, sa you were saved by faith, but you were saved for works that God prepared beforehand for you to walk in them. One of the most glorious things about the Christian life is that as Christians, our life has a purpose. That God has chosen us, not merely in a, in a general sense, but he had chosen us for works that he had for us to walk in. Mary had an astonishing series of works for her to walk in. She was favoured. The hand of God was upon her. She was a woman who was given immense responsibility. And she was accountable for that responsibility. If you want to look at the parable of the talents, she was given a lot of talents. 
We don't get to choose who we are. We don't get to choose if we're going to be a Mary or an Apostle Paul. We don't get to choose if we're going to be a pastor or an evangelist. We don't get to choose if we're going to be a man or a woman. I know that's, that's kind of radical in this day and age, but we don't. We, we, don't, we don't get to choose our lives. We, we, we're under this illusion that, that we get to say, well, I'm going to be this and I'm going to do that. But we don't. God determines so much our sovereign God. And what I see in this passage is I see the intervention of God who comes into this young girl's life. She may have only been sort of 16 years old. She's betrothed to a man that she probably barely knows. And now she's being told, oh, by the way, you're going to be pregnant. Don't worry, you're favored. And you're going to change the course of human history and of Jewish history because God who had departed from your people is now going to be with you and in you. And this huge thing is put upon her. She didn't get to choose this. She didn't lie awake at night saying, you know, I'm only 13, but in three years' time, I really want to give birth to the Messiah. This was something that God just intervened and said, you, O favored one, I have a job for you. That, my friends, is the reality of life. She didn't choose to be the mother of the Messiah. She didn't choose to be an unwed pregnant mother in first century Palestine. She didn't choose any of those things. One of the hardest things for us to reconcile is this. That we have things in our lives that we didn't choose. Health issues, sadness, sorrow, death, our plans not going the way that we wanted, our dreams falling apart around us, things that we hope for not coming to pass. Our life is full of sadness and tragedy, things that we would never choose for ourselves. Christmas is a time of great joy for so many. It's a time of gathering together. But let us not forget that for many, Christmas is a time of sadness. It's a reminder of families not being as they should, not being as complete as the, perhaps they used to be. Things not being quite how we want or how we would have them be. And this passage that speaks of Mary and God's intervention to her speaks greatly to us in the midst of this. She was greatly troubled at the saying. It's interesting, it wasn't just that an angel showed up, that would trouble her enough, but the text specifically says she's troubled at the saying. And she's troubled at the saying because she tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. <laughs> when God intervenes in your life, when his hand is upon you, I'm still not quite sure what kind of, <laughs> what kind of message that is, really. There's a guy I used to know at a church we used to go to back in, in London, in England. And uh, he was the caretaker of the school where the church used to meet. And when he, he came to church on a Sunday morning because he had to unlock the building so we could have church. And the church, uh, the school was hired out to a Seventh-day Adventist church on a Saturday. And then it was hired out to us on a Sunday. And he had to come and unlock it and then he go, went and hid in his office and then he'd have to lock it up after we went. And when we first turned up, he was, oh, I don't like church, don't like God, blah, 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 blah. And, you know, after a few more months, he, uh, he started telling us how he didn't like the Seventh-day Adventist, but we were all right. <laughs> don't like coming in on Saturday, but I, I, you, you guys are all right, I don't mind coming in. And then the assistant pastor, who used to be a, a Christian musician of note back in the 60s and 70s, made quite a few albums and stuff. He, he liked playing the guitar, this, this, this caretaker, so they kind of start to play the guitar together and stuff. He started hanging out. I noticed at church, there'd be this kind of area, a bit like our little area here at the back, where you could kind of be in church but not be in church. And he'd be out of his little cubbyhole, his office area, and he'd kind of just be hanging around, you know, talking, hearing the sermon, but not, not listening, you know, just kind of hearing it. And this happened over a period of months and months and months, and then I come to a couple of years, and eventually he got saved. And it was just, it was just the most wonderful story, that this, there was this man 
who just didn't want to be there, was forced against his will to have to turn up on a Sunday morning for work to open up for these strange people. And God gradually used this to bring him to a point of salvation. And it's just, it's just a story of, of, of God's imposition and a story of great joy. But his wife wasn't happy about it. She didn't like him having this new saviour, this new love. And she divorced him for his faith. Isn't that like Mary? God just intervenes in your life and he brings this great joy and he brings this great favour and at the same point, what kind of message is this? Because, because the path of a Christian, the path of Christ, let's be absolutely clear, is not a path of abundant joy alone, though it is that. It is also a path where we have a cup that overflows in Gethsemane, so to speak. It, it is a path that, though we have this joyous birth, there is then the slaughter of the innocents in Matthew chapter 2. Though we have the joy of Christmas, we're always walking towards the sacrifice of Easter. That he who was born was born to die. We're going to sing that in our last song. He was born to die for our sins. And he went to the cross and he says that if you want to come after me and be my disciples, you must deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. So when God's favor is upon you, he gives you joy, he gives you salvation, he gives you freedom from sin, but he also gives you a cross. Happy message this morning, huh? I think it's significant that she tries to discern the greeting. The angel says, don't be afraid, for you found favor with God. Christians, when you go through trials, when you go through suffering, when you suffer loss, when your dreams fall apart, when your plans go to pieces, when things happen to you, you wouldn't wish on your worst enemy. Don't be afraid. God's favor is with you. He who seeks to live a godly life in Christ Jesus, Paul tells Timothy, will be persecuted. The Christian life is a life of following Jesus, and we need to remember the journey of Christ to the cross. That's who we're following, that's where we're going. But don't be afraid. He who has work for you to do knows how to create the manure in which that fruit can grow. Don't be afraid. And the hand of God upon us when it comes in the forms of trials, when it comes in the form of providence we would not desire and choose ourselves, when that comes... It comes because God has his favour upon us. I want you to see where this ends. <clears throat> Behold, she's told the details. You will conceive in your womb and bear a son. You shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there will be no end. And for the last two weeks, for those of you who've been here, we've been going through the prophecies concerning the Messiah and what was prophesied of him. And Mary knew her Old Testament well enough to understand that from expressions like Son of the Most High, throne of his father David, reigning over the house of Jacob, and a kingdom having no end, she's seeing Psalm 2, she's seeing Daniel, she's seeing Isaiah, she's seeing all of these various prophecies from Genesis through. She knows what is being said, that the one who was prophesied that would be both God and man, the one who would be the Jewish king, the one who would have a throne that would, live, <coughs> that would exist forever and would never end, that that one was going to be her child. She fully understood. And so Mary asks and says, how can this be since I'm a virgin? And the angel answers and says, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. 
Therefore, the child to be born will be called holy, the Son of God. There will be no Father, humanly speaking, but rather the Holy Spirit will come upon you. There is no, well, is this okay with you, Mary? God the Holy Spirit is going to come upon you and he will, he will ensure by this overshadowing, let's not get into the specifics of that theology, but, but he will ensure that you, are, that you become pregnant. There will be Mary, the human mother, and then there will be no human father because this one is going to be the son of God. And that's how it's going to happen. But again, in this part of the text, we don't see Mary being offered some options here. We don't see Mary being said, now, I'm hoping we can do this in three months. What's your, what's your schedule like? This is God intervening and saying, I have chosen you, you are favoured, this is going to happen. Friends, this is the point I've been trying to emphasise this morning. That this is our life, is it not? None of us are going to be as highly exalted as Mary. Most of us, our names will never be remembered beyond a few. A few people may remember us for a few generations. Maybe we'll be on some Ancestry.com list for, for, a, for a while after we've gone. But we are like Mary in that when God comes into our lives and intervenes and imposes upon us, then he brings both joy and a cross. And despite the cross, we are favoured. This is true of all who believe. And I want you to see this at the end. He speaks of Elizabeth who miraculously in her old age is conceived, that's John the Baptist. He tells, reminds her that nothing is impossible with God. I can do this, this will happen, this miracle will come about. And Mary's response I want you to see, I want you to see this really, really clearly. Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. We don't get to decide when, how, and in what manner God intervenes in our lives. We don't get to decide what blessings he brings and what trials he brings. We don't get to decide whether our hopes and dreams all come true or whether they come crashing down around us. Mary is betrothed to Joseph, she's got this life ahead of her, and now everything has changed. Everything is different. So, when we have angelic interactions in Scripture, the angel typically has the last word. This is intriguing in that in this one, Mary is allowed the last word. You know why? Because it's a really good word. She says, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word, according to your will. If you've suffered loss this year, if Christmas isn't quite what you hoped it would be, if you don't have a full quota of family gathered, if you've had a, things that you hoped would be in place this year that aren't, there's only two things you can do. You can fight it, or you can accept it. Not in a stoic, stiff British upper lip kind of sense, but in the sense of, I am your servant. Let it be according to your will. And there's a place for tears, and there's a place in life for absolutely mind-blowing joy as well. And when God places his hand upon us, when he intervenes in our, our lives, when he comes in and when he declares, I have plans for you, when his favour is upon us, we tend to get both. And I hope and I pray that this Christmas and forevermore, we would be the kind of people when God intervenes, 
who say, I am your servant. Let it be to me according to your word, according to your will. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for the gift of Christ, the incarnation, God becoming man. And you did that, you brought that about through this young girl. Through this young girl who sought no such thing. You chose her for such a task, for such a time, for such a purpose. Father, I pray for each and every one of us here, Lord, that we would accept your calling with the words of Mary. But we are your servants, and may everything be according to your word and your will. The good, the bad, and the ugly. How much good you brought to this world through the calling, the choosing of Mary. Though our impact may be lesser, it is what you have chosen us for. May we, like her, be found to be faithful with the calling that you have given to us. Amen. Thank you.